I have strong memories of uh, winter days sitting on the floor of the living room next to a hot, uh, warm stove and my mother allowing me to cut out silhouettes of farm animals, birds, whatever was on the farm, ducks, cows, and dropping them on the floor. And of course, I would pick up the ones I did, but she would pick up the, the waste papers. So that at least meant she was tolerant of what I did and approved of what I did. So uh, that was the beginning. And, and the other phase of the preschool was that uh, in the summertime, being a farm family, we had irrigation water that came down rows. And if any of you know about irrigation, at least in those days, it was rather primitive. And the water would come down after it went through the rows and go into what we called waste ditches. Literally, literally it meant leaving the water to go and dissipate on down further, further drain ditches. I discovered in, in the summertime that I would go out next to the porch. We had every town, I mean, every farmhouse had a porch, and our porch was no exception. There was a swing in it, and also this ditch was just a, beyond the road to a place where I could find the best bud in the world after the water in the drain ditch had a chance to dry up a little bit, and the mud was unbeatable. It was great. <laughs> And that was my introduction to ceramic sculpture. And I discovered later on, when I was in my uh, 20s, that actually that clay was excellent clay. So it was a, a great source of fun, even in my more mature days and where I had learned something about ceramics. As I got a little older and went to school, that had great opportunities, too. And the opportunities there were mainly that there was organization. And I was, again, still retaining an interest in sculpture. They gave me a block of plastiline. And I imagine there was not more than a quarter of a pound. I don't think the school could afford to give every student any more than that. More than that. And so uh, uh, the uh, plastiline was introduced to me. And then they had school exhibits, and the teachers kind of uh, pushed me along a little bit, and we entered contests, and the contests were usually sort of like a uh, uh, county fair, even a state fair, where you would have representatives from each class doing work that would be something that the school would want to show during the fair. and. Uh, so those were great opportunities. Finally, I moved on into high school. And in high school, I found greater opportunities. The teachers were naturally, we had a traveling art teacher. We, the town could not afford a, a system that would allow real traveling teachers to go to the grade schools. We had to use the hope. We had teachers that were interested in art and would be able to present it in a way. But now we had professional art teachers who were trained for that, some for painting and color, and none for sculpture, unfortunately. But that was a great addition, being in high school. I discovered that, uh, that there was an opportunity also. There was a magazine, which I happened to be able to buy. I paid for it myself with money I earned on the farm. And it was an open road for boys. And it left a problem. Every month, there would be somebody that needed to be saved in this event, like a guy maybe falling in a crocodile's mouth or something. <laughs> and, and how are you going to save this guy? He's already headed for it, you know. And the object of the young artist or the cartoonist was to actually save this particular character in whatever situation he was. And I happened to send drawings, uh, sending in the contest, and darn if I wasn't accepted and even won some money. And uh, that money I uh, utilized to buy a 
correspondence course. I got a letter in the mail from a guy called himself W.L. Evans, Seagar's cartoon teacher. You probably have no idea who Seagar was, but Seagar was the cartoon originator of Popeye. And Popeye, when I was a kid, was a very important strip. And I loved it. I looked at it every day. And here this W.L. Evans would send a picture with Popeye on the outside that was every bit as good as Seagar could do. So it was, <laughs> it was a wonderful opportunity for me. And, and so uh, high school then went into college. And I uh, chose two schools. The first school was called Western State College. And I thought I had a rather reasonable good art teacher there. But the Depression came on and was well on at this stage of my schooling. And uh, the uh, uh, problem of staying in school without money was not a very likely thing to do very long. But I went to Colorado University. We had what we called a co-op house. Stayed in a, it's, it was in an old uh, frat house. And we had, they called us the communist club. Well, there wasn't one communist in the whole batch. But it was using the system of cooperation to stay in a place for a reasonable amount of money by doing your share of work in the the house. But even with that, I ran out of money because there's a slight tuition. It wasn't much, but I needed enough money to keep clothing and keep everything going. And But I did do more advanced artwork there, too. But I didn't like the teacher very much. He surrounded himself with beautiful girls, and, and, and they, they, they didn't pay much attention to us. And so, so that was the end of my my schooling as such. And then I was, I guess, moping a little bit, and my older brother, who graduated from Colorado University and also studied art, but he was studying education with a real fervor because artists at that time were being supported by the government. We had things called PWA, Public Works Programs, WPA, Works Progress Programs, all kinds of things. And the artists at that day were actually uh, painting murals on courthouses, things that would fit the area or the era. And uh, it was, there were no famous American artists. Grant Wood, the whole batch were doing things like that at that time who weren't being helped by the government. They, after the Depression was over, they, were, they became who they were. They were really qualified artists. But uh, that was uh, an important era. And it meant to me that I had to do something. Wait a minute. My, bro my brother says, you don't, don't go around moping. And my mother joined in with him and says, you, Blaine, you can draw. And my brother says, you can draw as well as any of these guys. So send in drawings to Disney. I said, oh, I, I, that won't, I've never been to art school. I don't know. I can't. I can't ink like those pictures that I see, you know, the movies. I love their movies. But I said, I can't ink like that. But they said, go ahead, send in drawings. Well, I sent in drawings and forgot all about it. I was 20 years old when I sent those drawings in. <laughs> but finally, having forgotten about it, and I was chopping wood one afternoon, and my mother came rushing out and said, Blaine, you've been accepted into a class in the Disney studio. You'd be class in animation. And, uh, well, I thought then, this is, this is great. At first, it was a mixture of glee and how am I even going to get there? I don't have enough money to take a, make, pay a train ticket to get out there. So I borrowed $200 from the Rotary Club and another $200 from a friend of mine's mother who was a big cattle rancher. They had over 50,000 acres of cattle uh, acreage in, in Colorado. And so I bought a cheap Montgomery Ward suit, which my wife said was the ugliest, wife later said was the ugliest suit she ever saw. <laughs> and anyway, uh, that was me beginning to do. I went there, 
And Walt had a program that was very unique and very, very important. It was that we not be so myopic that we thought we were the sole studio. You know, in animation, we thought animators were what made the studio. No, his object was to think we have musicians, we have story people, we have background painters, we have everything. It's not just animators. In fact, the animators begin to look pretty subordinate to us because as we went around, we found that uh, as the music permeated through the hallways of, of the projection rooms, that actually those were projectionists that I didn't even think about. There's guys showing the films in small, what they call sweat boxes, because in the 30s, they still didn't have air conditioning. And it was in the summertime, they really were sweat boxes. And it was, it was a very uncomfortable situation. So I took every chance I could because the music of Fantasia was permeating this place. And the beautiful music of Beethoven, all of the great musicians that, that were involved in Fantasia came through. And so it was a very big benefit to become acquainted with the studio. What was absolutely right on. In fact, just a little before I was in that group, the chairman of the board, Card Walker, was also in traffic. So that was not an exceptional thing. It wasn't just for the artist. Or, it was for every important person that they were going to have. And so that was the, uh, that was really pretty much leading up to the class in animation. And what the object there was to go into the animation directly because in contrary to being taught, they had spent all of their main money on a new studio in 1940. And this mean, meant that, that all of us in that were going to be artists or whatever, we were going to have to go directly into the vocation that we were going to do. So my choice, not choice, but where they put me, was actually in a place called the Annexes, which were doing, still doing Disney shorts. They were rapidly being eliminated because they simply were, were uh, too expensive for Disney to do for the small amount that they got. Some of you, I don't think any of you are old enough to go back that far, but I'll bet your grandparents are. And that would be that you would be able to actually see a movie and there was always a preceding cartoon. And Mickey Mouse was the, the favorite of all of them. He was better known than any other person in the world, even at that time. So that was, I had an assignment, and it was a, a picture called Bone Trouble. It wasn't an important picture. It was with uh, Pluto. But darned if I didn't get a $5 bonus. Well, that was a third of my salary. They paid, they paid me $16 a week. So if you could imagine, that was it. So now I've led you up to, to where uh, we, I am in animation, and I finally get to become an animator. And uh, animation was a, 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 a thrilling job, but they didn't have a job in character animation for me. So I had to become a, an effects animator. Most of you probably had never heard of effects animator, but they're in every picture. There'll be credit for it on any of the uh, films that you see by Pixar or any of the others. Effects animation was actually everything except the characters. And you say, well, what's that? That's nothing. And it actually is something. We had to do the shadows. We had to do what we call pixie dust on Peter Pan. Peter Pan flying around, he had to have pixie dust on him. And, the, and, and it, I hope that we had a, a film here, but it did not work, Wes, that, as uh, Jennifer may have told you, that uh, these, the thing would not work with their machines. But we had a DVD that actually showed uh, effects animation, how it was done and being done. And uh, anyway, that lasted 10 years. And I got tired of it, so I had an opening with the top animator in the place to just work with him. 
His name was Frank Thomas, and he was a marvelous uh, animator. And uh, many considered him to be the best in the world. And uh, he took an interest in my work. I first did a test on Lady in the Tramp. And I, had, uh, I, I hadn't even studied the story that they had developed already. But I took uh, the idea of something I had done, and most of you have done if you've had pets or, or dogs, and you take a stick and throw it. And the, if the dog is smarter than the one that I have now that I gave Wes, uh, he doesn't believe in fetching. He wouldn't fetch anything. But that I wanted to have a tramp having a stick sailed over his head. That was uh, the tramp of Lady in the Tramp. And then he'd go about galloping over and pick it up and come back with a gleeful, happy look on his face. Well, I showed that to Frank, and he said, well, that's as good as some of the things we have in the film in the, in the uh, Lady in the Tramp now. But I don't know whether that was a compliment or, <laughs> or a slam, you know. But anyway, it was, uh, he, he said, you can come to work with me, and I'll be happy to work with you. And uh, so uh, that was a great phase. And I did animate in character for 10 more years. Ten years as an effects animator, and ten years as a character animator. And uh, that leads up to a whole, I had three careers at Disney. It leads me up to the whole late one, where Walt uh, told Frank, he said, uh, I need Blaine to help me with a Disneyland project, which he, he knew I was a sculptor because I had, <coughs> it was my hobby, and I had exhibited at the, uh, at the studio library, animators would want me to, I mean, who are painters, would want me to exhibit my sculpture with their, to, sort of to go along with their paintings, which were on the walls of the library. And uh, it, was a, it was a case where I was exhibited those two or three times. But Walt didn't miss anything. He saw my sculptures, and he... He had never forgotten. He didn't tell me about it, but, except one time he did have me go up to see Edgar Bergen, who at that time wanted to have a new character that he wanted me to design, and I was going home for my first vacation from Disney, and I thought, no, no, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to give up my home vacation when you've been away for over a year and, and, and for to do something for Edgar Bergen. It turned out it was a flop, and I don't know who did it, but it, it, uh, it was a rooster he wanted me to do. But it was uh, a case where Walt chose me to give up animation and go in and head up the sculpture department and become a director on the three-dimensional characters. And uh, I... I acted like I was sorry about it, and I guess I was. But actually, when I got there, and Walt was as enthusiastic, those who were new him and worked with him during Snow White, they actually said he's just as enthusiastic as he was when he did Snow White, which was his first feature. So that was a... Now that is getting into the very end of my career, because I still was doing that up until I retired, in 1983, and I did work with them 10 more years after that. Yeah, you might want to just check and see uh, what's on the screen. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Because this is a, this, these were actually. This steps. is some that I actually uh, did while I was animating. Animated. These are models. Uh, there's a new release of this film, which is Sleeping Beauty. And these are models that I did while I was working with Frank Thomas. He asked me to do them. And, uh, that's the Meriwether, Flora, and Fauna. And uh, the reason that was done, you can see that the, uh, you can't see too well, but those hats have, have uh, little ribbon-like things here that uh, are uh, very difficult as you turn them. It's a complicated hat, and animators were greatly benefited by having a three-dimensional model to rotate and look at. You can imagine in Bambi the turning the antlers of a deer was greatly aided by using a three-dimensional uh, 
character to turn as you animated your character. Because if Walt, one of the greatest uh, desires of Walt in a picture was that it not only be entertaining, but to be believable. And if you had something that wasn't working, that was simply not uh, in Walt's liking. And so uh, I don't know what else. I'm sorry, uh, Jennifer, you did a beautiful job. And was there anything that I missed that I should go back to? Okay, well, thank you, Wes. Oh, this <coughs> this was, uh, I was standing just watching Walt as they were filming the uh, Disney uh, uh, night show. I think it was on Sunday night. Uh, and uh, the project that we were working on at that time was Lincoln, and he wanted me to, he called me up there, and he had lines about, I had told him about where I got the mask for that. It was a, mask, a life mask of Lincoln. It was made in 1860. And I told him what it was, and he kept forgetting it. He said, oh, get up here, Blaine. So I was up with Walt on, the, on this particular program, and he did it later, too. We did that. But uh, that mask was actually made by a sculptor, a Chicago sculptor named Leonard Volk. I still remember it. And he was actually the uh, brother-in-law to the wife of Leonard Boke, this guy that did this life mask of him. In other words, Lincoln had beaten uh, Stephen Douglas in a debate, and uh, now his brother-in-law made this life cast of Lincoln just before he became president. This was in 1860, and uh, just before he... He, he didn't have his beard yet. He hadn't talked to a young lady that said he looked better with a beard. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is Walt uh, asking me what, what it is and so forth. That was a long time ago, you can see. Yes? Yeah. Can you talk about these? Oh, yes. Now, these, <laughs> these are what you call fairly contemporary work. Uh, Walt died in 1966. He was just 65 years old. He was a heavy smoker, and I hope none of you are. But anyway, he, uh, he really uh, suffered a lot from that. And even that's one of the ways we had recognized him coming down the hall was that he would have this cough. It was almost like a gesture of his own uh, uh, kind of getting us ready for him. It's sort of a courtesy, I thought, in those days. But we'd, we'd know what it was. But this is a bust that I made of uh, Walt. And uh, we have quite a few of those around in different places, and I can't tell you where they are. But we have a very similar head on the statue that I did. I don't know how many of you have been to Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland, before you get, you, you walk to the castle. And this statue of partners, thank you, stands in front of the castle. And you'll see the head is virtually the same because I, I still had to use what I thought what it looked like. And Mickey, of course, was, this is right in front of castle where you go to, uh, to uh, tomor Tomorrowland and every one of the lands come from that, branch out from that area there. But... Uh, it was uh, a, uh, I had a little bit of fear and trepidation when I was asked to do that because I knew everybody had his own version of what Walt looked like. And I had to use mine. I couldn't be going around and asking people to, how, how would you view him? Or, no, I didn't ask anybody. I just did it because it, it wouldn't have been safe to have gotten into an argument with anybody. I knew his own family had their own versions of him. I certainly couldn't recreate him, but I could give what I thought. In fact, most people kind of felt that it looked like an illusion. It was a pretty good illusion of Walt. And this is a, uh, it's a good picture, uh, Jennifer. It's a little bit close, and so it, it distorts the perspective. But that's uh, Senior George Bush, and I did these. I did all of that stuff. In fact, 
Even I did the statue after I was retired. Most of the things I did after 1983. And this is George Bush Sr. Okay. And also I, they gave me this out of doing Clinton. And, uh, and this is George Bush that's now George Bush, George W. Bush. So and you're working on photographs? That's all I had. I wish I had the real guy. <laughs> The, the uh, one that uh, I almost had, Marty Sklar, who was the head of our department, the guy who I almost had a chance to do, or to look, take, at least take measurements and have a chance to really look at him in life, was Eisen, Eisenhower. And he was ill, and he was in California, and uh, the guy that was head of our department says, Blaine, I think you're going to be able to do him. Or I think we're going to be able to get you over there to see him. But he never was well enough. He had had a diverticulitis surgery or something of that sort at that time. He did recover, thank goodness. But this is two other assignments that were given to me for a, uh, after I was retired. I was doing these at home. And this is John Wayne. And how many of you recognize this one? We all do. You do? Yeah. Well, you're an older one. I mean, you're not, you're, you're not fair. I'm asking these youngsters. How, how many of you younger people know who this is on the over here? You do? Okay. You, you, who, who is it? That's right. You're good. Yeah. You, you good. But anyway, uh, uh, I, I would entertain questions. Now, uh, Jennifer, you got some more things here? Oh, well, this is, uh, <laughs> there was a young man in, uh, that uh, wanted to learn, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be a dirty old man or anything, but there was a young man that came to my house with his parents, wanting to know if I would give him some lessons on how to be a Walt Disney Imagineer. Well, I said, what is it you would like to do? He said, I would like to do a story about Santa Claus. And I said, I first tried to get him, pin him down what his version of Santa Claus is. And I said, you know, Santa Claus is done in all kinds of ways. And uh, what would you, what would you, what is your version of Santa Claus? I'd kind of be helping him. And I'd say, do you see an elfish Santa Claus? I said, does a night before Christmas? Rhyme have anything with your influence on Santa Claus? Oh, yes, yes. I was hoping he would come up with it, something himself, but I helped him a little to get it going. And uh, he, he said, I said, well, that would be an elfish Santa Claus. You remember the poem, A Jolly Old Elf, and had a, a stomach, a, a belly that, that uh, shook like a bowl full of jelly or something of that sort. But anyway... This was what I was doing this while he was doing his, and I was making drawings for him that would help him while I was doing this, too. And uh, I, I ran out of clay, because he was furnishing the clay, and I ran out of clay, as you can see. He doesn't have any enough for feet, not enough for arms or hands. But that was an elf, undersized. Remember, Santa Claus in the night before Christmas was uh, smaller than life size. Eight tiny, he wanted eight tiny reindeers, mm -hmm. <coughs> and a jolly little elf. So. But people should know that this sculpture is about. It's a small one. It's about this big. And, and Jennifer did she? I didn't even realize what she was photographing. She did an excellent <laughs> job. <coughs> and. Uh, well, it, shows, it shows the armature. Yeah. You know, the yes, the the, the uh, we ha and I was showing him that too, that you sculptors do not just uh, go anyway when they're doing objects with appendages. I don't care what it is. It's nice to have a framework of a skeleton in there. And we call that an armature. And uh, it, it does serve as a real good uh, uh, help in applying your clay gradually. This particular clay that I used at that time, and I did it with this one too, this is as large as I would ever go. This is a professional modeling material called polyform. And we bought it in hundreds of pounds at Disney's.
to do our story models for all of our Imagineering characters. He's he's uh, he, he's he's about this tall. Did you ever see him in person? Uh, I never did. I his son came out when I did that, and I did a portrait of him. And then Disney called me up just a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and uh, had me do a. Uh, they interviewed me for a discussion of my opinion of Will Rogers. And then they have a loop at his museum in uh, Claremore, Oklahoma. That's where the museum. And Disney was assisting them because Walt and Mickey and uh, uh, and uh, they were very close friends. And so there's a constant loop going. And I have one in one section where they used my portraits. This one, which was really just later used as a actual audio animatronics figure in a show called American Adventure. And in Epcot, I don't know how many, how many have ever been to Epcot? Hey, some of you have, good. In Epcot, there's an American Adventure pavilion right at the end of the lagoon. And in that one, we have a show that is about the United States and even the troubles and everything are done in one form, either in uh, uh, audio animatronics characters or something. Well, my job was to design the characters that we did. And so I have one like that, uh, Will Rogers, up on stage and, until it, one day it, his whole arm fell off, you know. But it, it, was, <laughs> it was a sad thing. But he actually makes a rope twirl. Will Rogers was a heck of a a very fine uh, entertainer, vaudeville entertainer, using rope tricks and all kinds of stuff, throwing ropes and the whole bit. So, Blaine, when you talk about the shows at Disneyland, I don't have a picture of it, but um, what you were doing there while you were actually working there was making characters like this for the rides and for the shows in Disneyland, right? For, like, That's right. The, all, the uh, all of these things had a goal. Actually, uh, 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 John Wayne is on a horse, and he's making a famous line. I won't attempt to try it, to say what it is, because it wouldn't sound like anything you'd ever heard. But he is on a horse, and you see him, one of the first things, in a show at, at uh, they call it a great movie ride, which is one of the important shows in this. Uh, uh, it's actually MGM, Disney MGM uh, it's actually a whole new, uh, new uh, theme park. We have four theme parks at Disney's, um, Walt Disney World, and one of them is, uh, one of them is uh, the Magic Kingdom, which was the first one, which is a copy of Disneyland, and then there is a theme park called uh, uh, Epcot, which was the next one, and that's the one where this and other things were. And even, well, actually, uh, I had a lot of good information to go by with Ben Franklin. And we had a wonderful sculptor uh, who was a French sculptor, came out and did Ben Franklin and uh, some of the great presidents. And I even used a lot of help from him on the Washington, George Washington that I did. And so, uh, we, you know, when you're doing this sort of thing, you use as much help as you can get because uh, we don't have, uh, you know, it's just not possible to have all of the information you need when you're going to sculpt a portrait of somebody. Wayne, I'd like you to talk about this whole notion of Imagineering. For your students, you kind of have to remember when Disney started, it was totally radical new art form. It's, you know, we all accept this, we all watch cartoons, we, everything that happens uh, you know, on a computer. But at one point, none of that existed. So when Disney started this, this was like nobody could have imagined this. And when he did Fantasia and combined right. drawing all this, this was radical art form. And it's taken years, of course, for 
for cartoons and that kind of work to be accepted in the art world, and that's a whole other thing. But could you talk about what that was? Like? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Dean. That's a very I appreciate that. Actually, uh, uh, Imagineering came after the first word that was used when they told me that I was going to have to give up animation, which I dreaded, uh, and be go over at Red Enterprises. And Red Enterprises did not describe it nearly as well as you just came up with the actual word that it came became. Red Enterprises was after Walt's three initials, W-E-D, Wed, and that's where I was going, to Wed Enterprises. It was his own company at that time. And uh, uh, he, uh, this man, is, uh, his vision was absolutely beyond belief. Uh, I, uh, I was in awe of the guy, actually, because here he is, a man that left school when he was not more than 15, and he had a partner who's actually the grandfather of two Irish boys, John and Larry, here, and also Leslie Iwerks, who is a very uh, well-known documentary artist. And uh, it, it was uh, that two combination, Walt Disney and Ab Iwerks, that worked together. Iwerks lived a week longer than Walt did. And uh, it was uh, just a great thing what they were able to do. And I asked Ab at one time when a derogatory uh, write-up had been written in, of all things, in a book form of how Walt didn't deserve the credit for what he was, had, had been told, people had told the other people who, what he was, this great genius. He said, no, he says, the genius was Ab Iwerks, the grandfather of Larry and John. And uh, it was a, uh, uh, a case where I went to Ub and I said, Ub, what do you think about this? He says, it's a lie. He says, everything's a lie. He says, I knew what was the idea man. I knew he was a genius when we were 18 years old. They started together at 18, of all things, mm -hmm. and uh, doing one thing and another in progressive tendencies toward trying to do something better. And, and uh, the name, getting back to your question here, the name Imagineering came after being mulled over a lot, not only by Walt, but others, that what is it? It's engineering. It's uh, animation. And it became Walt Disney Imagineering. And it's far more romantic than Wood Enterprises. <laughs> it's a little more descriptive, in my opinion. But, uh, did, did you have the sense at that time that you were participating in something that have, would, would have this incredible worldwide impact? Uh, no, I, I, I must say, uh, I, I remember one time when I said I was in awe of Walt. When he first asked me to do Lincoln, I thought, oh no, this is better than sacrilege. We're going to make it, this guy a mechanical dummy, you know? And I had a great admir I had a great admiration I had a great admiration for Lincoln, and Walt, of course, did too. But he had uh, he had this idea. I knew how crude our system was, really. I knew that flesh was not the kind of a rubbery skin that we had, which was horrible. And as far as being real and believable goes, but I sat in front of the show one day down at Disneyland. And there were people behind me crying with emotion from the show of Lincoln getting up there and talking. Of course, there was the Battle Hymn of the Republic that went along with it and some other emotional things. But uh, I, uh, I couldn't believe, you know, this guy was right. And so I, I made the statement in, that was quoted of me that, uh, I, guess who had the vision around here? Dave Gibson obviously didn't have the vision. Walt could see that the people would see it with more imagination than perhaps I give them credit for and make it really believe that for a while Lincoln was there talking to them.
Do you all know what he's talking about, this, the Abraham Lincoln sculpture? It first appeared, I believe, in 1964 at the World's Fair in New York, right? Well, it was... Abe, Abe Lincoln stands up. Yes, he does. It had never, ever been seen. No, it, uh, it, it was really... There are some things that can be very, you could say, tragic, but in this business, nothing is tragic. It's just that we're, we're not perfect. <laughs> Our business is not perfect by any means. But I was there one time, and uh, Lincoln got up, and he sat right down. He went up and down, and up and down. <laughs> and so, so I said, to, went around to find out who the guy was running the machine, because they get to thinking about something else. And that can go on, and it, it really it can really ruin the, the program for people that have come there. And I said, look, Lincoln's b bouncing up and down. Every time he sits down, he gets up again. And so they went and corrected it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Mr. Gibson, I have some images here of films that you worked on when you were still an animator. Could you just quickly talk about the characters that you animated in these? I'll be happy to. And any questions about animation, thank you, Jennifer. Blaine, would you Let's look at some the of these? Some of these. I did not do any of that. <laughs> I, 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 and that was way beyond me at that time. But these were, these, thank you. These were atmosphere uh, artists. Every time we did a picture, we had great talented. That's why there's, there's always going to be room that, for people that can paint and draw and have ideas. There's always going to be room for that. But. Uh, the first thing that I worked on, that's how this came to be and how you got this, is that I was, I did in-betweens on flying horses, starting from way up here as little teeny guys and coming clear down here and where they land is filling up the screen with a mother horse, a mother flying horse, and the little ones following. This was done, I was doing in-betweens. Have you got any idea what an in-betweener is? Do some of you do? Do you know what it is? Between the original drawings. It's the very last in between. It's the bottom of the totem pole <laughs> of evolution of becoming an animator. You're doing the very lowest job that you can possibly be doing and still be in animation. And that's where they sent me when I won that little award of $5 for getting my scene done on schedule, <laughs> under budget. But actually, these things wouldn't work without those in-betweens in there. It wouldn't jitter, but it wouldn't be quite as smooth. Because when a thing is sailing through, when the animation speed is beyond a certain point, you have to have in-betweens, or it'll even jitter. So that's the function of an in-betweener. But fortunately, you don't stay an in-betweener. You get up to where you can do the guy that's the breakdown man. He does the one with maybe a whole chart, and he does the one, one of those in the chart where there's two or three drawings to be left. He's pretty good. He thinks he's pretty good, but that's not good. The assistant has to do the very final first drawings that represent the animator's drawings. And she's, she's put up an image of, of the oh, yeah. one down <coughs> Well, yes, uh, that probably wasn't my scene, but uh, I worked on 101 Dalmatians also, as well as Sleeping Beauty, and did get screen credit on it. But I was not the star animators. The star animators would, uh, they would always give you a, throw you a plum or something. You would get a scene where there's a little bit of dialogue I did have scenes with dialogue in this one, and also in Sleeping Beauty. In Sleeping Beauty, I had a scene where the king is witnessing Maleficent, the evil, the evil fairy. There are three fairy, four fairies, but three are good fairies, and Maleficent was a totally evil fairy. And she came in at the door with great flashes of lightning when the other uh, good fairies are just finishing their gifts to this baby Aurora, and uh, the uh, the uh, Maleficent stands there, and I will give you now my more thunder. I'll give you <laughs> my gift. My gift is going to be death. 
she's going to prick her finger. You all know the story. And she's going to die. And she will see that no prince ever gets to her to kiss her because she, the whole castle is covered with great, great uh, Barbie, great hedges around the whole place that are just taking over the place. Nobody could even get there. So you animated that scene where she's talking? No, no I didn't. No, I had nothing to do with that. I wish I could do it. <laughs> But I did do the king, and he was an important character there for just a second or two. In fact, I, I told an audience where my son happened to be there one time at the theater downtown called uh, the uh, uh, El Capitan Theater, which Disney owned. And they were showing the, they show these new releases with their cleaned up versions. And I told him, I said, well, if you don't blink, you're going to see this scene. But it was pretty noisy. He said, seize that creature. That's, and so actually the, uh, the uh, scene was seen. They even, uh, Wes and I didn't stay because we had to get home back to California, to Santa Barbara. Oh, yes. I, I, uh, they had that scene in that book, I mean, in that group that I hoped that you could get on that DVD. But this was a scene that I had in uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty. No, no, I mean in 100 Dalmatians, where the, all of these dogs, what is happening is that uh, Pongo is picking a mate for his, his pet, Roger, who's a musician, not making much money on anything, but he's a musician anyway. And he's looking out the window, and he'd pick out these various ones, and he'd see that, no, 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 not, that's not good. And he'd go on and on until finally, Perdita, which happens to be a 101 Dalmatians, do you have that one? Yeah. Well, this shows a scene later, which I helped work on too. But that one was, this is, Pongo and, and Perdita, and uh, the, he manages to get them tangled up, but he, that one he approves of, and so it ends up that they both fall in the pool there. And uh, Blaine, when you, when you say you worked on, what, would you do like the actual drawing? Of uh, I would. Uh, I probably didn't do that one. Probably Frank Thomas, my senior animator, did that. But I did one with, I, w I was involved in it in two or three scenes, yeah. But, but what I mean is... Uh, but but that, I don't put the spots have, on. Oh, you you have an assistant put the spots on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for assistance. No, the spots would drive you crazy. If none of the animators, oh, none of the animators did any spots. <laughs> but uh, they do plunge in there, and it's a very embarrassing situation, and neither one of them knew how to accept it. And you know how the story goes. Naturally, they fell in love with each other, and Perdita and Pongo are sort of having a whatever a dog marriage is, and it's pretty good. So actually, it was quite interesting. Now this is getting back to Sleeping Beauty. Uh, in Sleeping Beauty, I don't lay really claim to that. Mark Davis did that Sleeping Beauty drawing of the girl. He did Maleficent. He loved villains and did villains, and he also did. Uh, the best looking girls. He was good. He was very good at that. Well, I may be wrong about this, but one of the things that Disney started doing very early on before anybody else did was this combination of the flat two dimensional with this fully realized three dimensional. Well, uh, th that's good. Actually, even in our two dimensional drawing, uh, when I'm teaching people drawing, I say there's a bunch of kinds of different drawing. There is. Uh, a type of drawing that was used during World War II, I don't think it was ever used before that, which actually had what we call three-dimensional linear drawing. And the reason for that is that the two-dimensional drawing that was in the shops where you order parts and so forth, it was very difficult for people to look at that and analyze it because the, the, you're looking at a single view of maybe the top and the bottom and so forth, but a single view of each. So a, a thing was introduced called production illustration. So some of our Disney draftsmen went to work on that because they would draw these nuts and bolts, showing them 
in three dimensions in one drawing so that any guy off the street could see what it was like from this drawing. They had trouble analyzing it from the, from the uh, mechanical drawing. So uh, the draw these are some drawings actually, thank you, Jennifer. These are some drawings that during, I mentioned earlier about uh, the, uh, that correspondence course I took. All this guy told me on the correspondence course was, I want you to draw a bunch of figures using stick figures and building form around it. But you'll see what, this is where you actually even the, see those things are three-dimensional in my analysis, but it's only a single drawing. And they're done, these are much smaller, that's why, and this guy is showing, he's a professional artist, and see, he's showing me, I should put the cigar with a shape that went around the cigar. And some of you that are taking drawing or other forms of art, you see what an assist, see what mine is, I really got the big cigar all over his mouth, but I don't really have a nice thing following the form of his mouth. So that was a little correction that he made right on my drawing right there. But you see the guys on the motor scooter is sitting down. That drawing is only this big. But you can see in the guy standing on his head, there's an analysis of it being three-dimensional. And that's one type of drawing. You see the guy with the skis there. Those are very quickly done drawings. And this, of course, Hitler, this is just my sort of cartoon version of Hitler. I didn't have any pictures to go by or anything. Just my own version of what he, what he would be like. You, you you still draw because I I've seen some drawings in, 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 your, in your place, but I mean, do you still draw? I mean, oh sure, yeah. No, you can never forget out. Students it. still draw. Yeah, yeah, I still draw. Yeah. Well, you know, I I, I even did sculpture fairly recently, but uh, but thank you, Jennifer. You did a nice job with those photographs because I didn't really. We have a question over here. Um, were you around when Disney did the time lapse photography? Time lapse photography. Yeah, when he did like the flowers growing. Oh, I I know the people that did a picture uh, where they actually uh, did stop motion. Is that what you mean? Or right, right. The, there was a like the they did growing. time they they speeded up things when they were making Disneyland for the Walt Disney Show, but the uh, the uh, they did one. Two guys did it, and they were going to take my place. I mean, not my place. I got pulled into this because they didn't succeed in doing sculpture. <laughs> they were not sculptors, but they were darn good guys, and they did things like Noah's Ark and stuff like that, where they actually did stop motion and moved each one of these characters a little bit, very much like Pixar does, only Pixar does it with... Uh, with computer animation. They made, they made a monkey out of me when I was up there. They, there was one of the animators came and uh, he knew that I liked, uh, was an animator and enjoyed animation, but he, he said it was the, uh, one of the uh, Incredibles, it was the girl, and he had her up there and, and, and they had just finished this picture and he was one that actually worked on that picture, probably did the girl when he, in the picture itself. But, but what he did, he, had a, he gave me a mouse, and he says, I want that lady to move over from her hips, move over like this. And I, I started moving it. And he said, no, you have to move it further, move the mouse further. So I started making the mouse go further. And then I thought, gee, it'd be much easier for me to draw the darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and these guys get to where they're pretty skillful at doing that. And... Uh, as I was telling Nina before, is that the actually the uh, the animation in Pixar is contingent on a sculptor. The sculptors actually make a form. Don't worry, they don't necessarily create it all themselves. There's a lot of good artists that get in on it, including uh, John Lasseter and the very top guys. They get in and help develop the character. But the sculptor, because he's a sculptor, can get it into three dimensions. And this is a field that I'm sure Walt would have highly approved of 
because believability is there in the three dimension. It's no longer trying to make something three dimensional, but it is three dimensional. And the sculptor, having contributed to that, has made it possible for a computer to scan this and build what they call the wire form. Some of you may be already all ahead of me on this, but the wire form is a, a thing. It'd be like a cage, but a three-dimensional cage of the character. So you think Pixar really kind of picked up the ball from like Disney? To, who do you like? Um, well, I, I, I'm extremely fond of Pixar, right. and I happen to know that John Lasseter and uh, Brad Bird and others that are there actually got their training at Disney as linear animators. So already I have a respect for them. But they go and uh, uh, with this process are able to carry it. I'm sure Walt would have approved because it has believability to it. Ratatouille, I thought, was a great yeah. example of that. I think it was a very highly sophisticated movie and story. And, and, and you might say, well, uh, I don't like, uh, it, it revolts me to have all these rats running around. <laughs> and certainly having them fi fix a meal for you. But it was a, it was a real, it really was an amazing uh, situation. Blaine, would you have any words of wisdom for our students in terms of like a career in the arts? Spending a lot well, of I arts. can't exactly equate what happened to me. I did the same thing and I tried to kind of tie that in a little bit in my pre-scale work as I did when I was in my 70s later on when I was doing this much of this stuff that uh, Jennifer was able to photograph. I don't expect that and I don't expect to have your career set when you're 20 years old but uh, it uh, I will say this, that I was blessed with uh, the good fortune of having an entrepreneur like Walt and his cohort uh, of iWorks, who both <coughs> were without question exceptional people to begin with. And when you have that, they set up something that gives you something to shoot for. Even when I was a farm kid, I would go after the cows at night be up on the prairie, and I'd look across and think, yeah, it'd be wonderful to sometime work for Disney in California, but it wasn't the remotest possibility, I thought. I was about 12 then, and uh, by golly, it was a possibility. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I'm sure all of you young people would like to see an example, and I hope I have given you a little bit of it, of how you correlate what you learn in your art school and, and fit it in to an applicable, applicable situation where you can make a living at it. I don't know anybody that <coughs> wouldn't like to make a living at art that wants to be an artist. Well, I know a lot of people wouldn't want to be an artist, yes, but at least you would. Uh, yes? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, Walt, even when he was doing the cartoons, if you notice, he didn't stay on the little simple Mickey Mouse formula, which was a pear with a fairly round head on it and spindly little legs and spindly little arms with gloves on it. He wanted to get, and so if you notice the drawings in Sleeping Beauty, and uh, 101 Dalmatians, they are stylized, but they're fairly believable as what they are. And that was the direction Walt was seeking all the time, that things be believable. And uh, the, the drawing style had to evolve. And that's why I am absolutely certain he would have said, Pixar, you're right on, I'm with you. That's exactly what I would do because you can do it, and I no longer am going to be struggling. Well, getting back to your question about drawing, Walt hired the very best draftsman that he could get in the world, and one of them was one that, uh, that I uh, learned an awful lot from, and he would start off by saying, 
remember, you've got these models up here in front of you. And we had, we had live models, uh, mostly ladies, so it's kind of a partial thing. But, uh, but anyway, uh, that would be what we'd be drawing, and this guy named Rico Lebrun, Italy's best draftsman, would be guiding us. And he'd say, there's just as much drawing in a stone if you approach it the way I'm approaching this with this bottle. And when he was called in by Walt when he did Bambi, because Walt wanted the, this not to be just a flash in the pan thing. He wanted the animals, the deer, even though their heads are oversized and we have capabilities of speech and emotion by having certain exaggeration. He wanted them to look like deer and act like deer, but with human personalities. And so uh, uh, the people that were chosen on that, my uh, mentor, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, were keys on this most difficult drawing of Bambi and his mother and his father, who was a big, magnificent stag. All of those things were, were drawings that had to give the feeling of being real animals. And yet they had to have the human emotion. And I think Walt really liked Bambi pretty well because I think it just, just about reached that. But our drawing with Rico Lebrun was what contributed to that. I don't mean my drawing. I was just a, a beginner at that time. But that drawing of my, my mentors was absolutely wonderful. And Frank Thomas did a scene that some of you may remember if you've seen Bambi, where Thumper is teaching Bambi how to stand up on ice. Well, Frank, being such a brilliant man, he was, someone told me one time he was the most brilliant man to ever come out of Stanford. Well, I could believe it. It may be just a phony tale, but anyway, he figured out that with his great analytical mind that Bambi, on these stilt-like legs, which deer have, on ice was going to be the most awkward thing in the world. And he made him look awkward. He slipped and fell. And Thumper, who was a little agile rabbit, he ran around there and try to help Bambi get back up and that sort of thing. And so it was, uh, it was uh, uh, an achievement that we look at and we're entertained by it and we say, but we don't really know the, the thought process that was there. It was a very deep thought process and a very brilliant group of men that were working that out because analytical thinking was absolutely necessary. Thank you. Uh, I, did you hear that? The question was, do you have an experience with storyboarding? No, I, I didn't, but it's a very important phase. And the storyboard artists are very much appreciated. And very often, they're able with their ability to draw very quickly. And it, they're in the process of telling a story. It's really what it's all about anyway. And... Uh, it, uh, I didn't get involved in it, but it would have been a great training to do that because many of the animators did do story sketches and uh, before they came to animation. And because of the ability in doing their stories and creating characters, they became good animators too. But it, uh, there's nothing more important than telling the story. And in drawing, the object was to tell it as completely and as well as you could. Yes? Uh, uh, Glenn, did you ever have any notion of coming up with a cast of characters and asking Mr. Walt Disney to develop it? Well, I never was at that end of it. I was a further guy down the line. But that is a very key point when you get to that thing of getting it to where it's a motivator. When I was a sculptor, 
I felt that I was the motivator because the characters were in three dimension. There was uh, Dane implies they were going to be the actors of our shows, like the pirate ride. The actual story sketches were done by a former story sketch guy at Disney's and he, an animator who is a good animator. But I had to bring them into life by making them in three dimensions. And uh, I'll admit that uh, sometimes in that development that my wife and I would go out to dinner sometimes and or maybe to a, a theater or to a church even. And I'd see a character that was, boy, that's going to make a good pirate, you know. <laughs> because we had women in there too, you know. And uh, my wife would sort of kick me under the table and said, Blaine, you're staring at that man. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was embarrassing to her. And I realized, well, hey, you do, you, get, you do get a little carried away with what you're doing. And, but I felt that my mentor being Frank Thomas and some of the other great analysts, most analytical people you can imagine, uh, would have been just as good as a rocket scientist as anything else if that was what they wanted to do, I expect. But uh, they were, uh, it was really a great aid to, to have that formation period. First, I want to thank you, but I just have to thank uh, just a couple of things. I have housekeeping things I want. Well, let's thank Glenn Gibson for being here. Well, thank you all. I hope that I've touched on something, but I'm still alive, so <laughs> if some of you, if some of you feel like they don't want to know something that fits you better and I'm able to do it, I sure would, because I know the stage you're all in and and it, it's something that all of us are fortunate enough to go through, but it, it's a very great, I'm, I'm amazed at your facilities here. I can't even believe it. Here you are, a school with how many, how many uh, people are here in this art department alone? Who was it? How many, who was it? How many Nina, was it you telling me or was it? Every semester. Well, it's an awful lot of people. And I say, I was impressed when Dane showed me around through the, the various exhibits. You have great uh, galleries and things. And the students, I, I admire the variety, variety of your work. And uh, I will say this, that in commercial work, I do think, and I, I hope that is something that is worth listening to. In commercial work, you're always safe if you understand the classic concepts. We all have a desire when we're young, and I did too, of wanting to, hey, I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to launch out there. But the discipline of being, being able to draw a human figure or know something about an animal or know something about construction of a building or anything, all of those have applications that are practical. And I hope I touched on that a little bit. I happen to have been fortunate in the sense that I liked animals. The farm helped me with that. It helped Walt. He was he was on was on a farm during a very young period of his life, and he uh, he really uh, it really helped him in his goals. And his farm animals were in amongst his very first pictures. But thanks again. You've all been great. Thank you.